Woodstock was the beginning of a legacy that was never fulfilled. It would only feed bad habits, depression, and future choices. As Burt himself would say, I was involved in the two most famous countercultural events of the 60s, Hare and Woodstock. That and a token will get you on the New York subway. Welcome to Discography, the podcast that gives Gen X music maniacs a chance to smell like teen spirit again by connecting with a brotherhood obsessed with rating the entire discography of every single artist and band that ever mattered. I'm your host, Dave Gebro, and with three new episodes each week, you're going to gain a comprehensive knowledge of an act's history and output in the time it takes to listen to one album. And in this episode, we'll be turning our spray cans back on Burt Summer for Burt Part 2, covering the years 1970 to 1990 post-Woodstock, along with our very special guests, Angie Pope and Burt biographer Sharon Watts. This is part of our series about the four least fortunate acts that played Woodstock, which we're calling We Are Stardust, We Are Over. In the next hour, we'll learn about the debilitating drug habit that led to Burt's early 1970s incarceration, the honest-to-God Sid and Marty Croft kids' TV show on which Burt wound up later in the decade, the shockingly unexpected creative team behind Burt's very last attempt at the big time, and the car crash of a public access show on which Bert guested, from which it's absolutely impossible to look away, even for one second. Okay, first things first, you need to know just how seriously I take this craziness. Discography is heavily researched, and the music is always reassessed with fresh ears. We don't just cover albums. Uh Uh-uh. We do a searingly honest deep-dive analysis of all EPs, singles, comp tracks, relevant solo work, and sometimes bootlegs and live stuff. Every release is slapped with an objectively accurate star rating between 0 and 5, which allows us all. The real reason we do this, the Tootsie Pop reward at the center of the rock and roll lolly, to come face to face with the true shape of an artist's overall arc. Be sure to follow along with us chronologically as we go. The link to our legendary playlist is right there in the show notes. Coming up, we've got the remaining two volumes in our We Are Stardust, We Are Over series, the Keith Hartley Band and Quill, and much, much more. So don't miss out. Open up your listening app right now and click follow. And get ready to meet your new friends. They're all kicking it right now in our Facebook group, Discography Soldiers of Sound. That's the best way to find out what's coming up on the show, but there's a hell of a lot more. You get recaps of the day in music history, great artist and track recommendations, polls that put you in the driver's seat on guest and show topic decisions, access to a thriving creative hub if you're looking for your next collaborator, and much more. So make sure you don't miss out. You can find the link to the Discography Soldiers of Sound Facebook page right there in the show notes. And away we go then, with Angie and Sharon, as we traipse amongst the celestial spires of the Imaginarium, courtesy of the great and severely underrated Burt Summer, a non-stop achievement machine turned a spent force whose tap had been disabled, first by forces out of his control, and then by his own hand. Let's move on then to 1970. Inside Burt Summer. We start off with Smile. Uh, and I want to know, Angie, if this version with the sort of pounding tribal light West Coast rock production, if it hits you in the same way as as him with an acoustic guitar. It doesn't. And the thing is, it, had I heard this version first, the one on the album, I would have liked it. Yeah. But having heard the Woodstock version first, I which I absolutely love, this one just, uh, just falls uh, short. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, yeah. I like the production. However, having first heard the song at Woodstock, the moment it starts, I'm like, uh, only in relation to it, because the instrumentation has a sense of feeling tacked on if you're already familiar with the Woodstock version. But that being said, there is an organic band wooden pool shed warmth to it that's pleasant, at least. And the organ 
swells like a sunrise and there's a tumbleweed connection like warmth to the feel of it that to me elevates the song above its folk song genesis so it's a terrific set closer a nice little album opener too since its purpose seems to be positioning itself as a kumbaya arm in arm anthem kind of deal it's a it's a good song it could have been better on the record i completely agree i i just really like the the stripped down slower version from woodstock that the cheesy pop arrangement you know is it's pleasant but not in comparison great song good performance yeah agreed i gave it a three on the album Karen, you hate this song you know i'm not rating uh you know i don't hate anything really um i agree i i normally when i hear albums i always prefer the what i know first best because it just lodges in but i definitely prefer the woodstock version yeah you know it's weird uh, it's the, this is my first uh realization of this I think it's the best song on side one and the worst track on side one. Wait, not true. It's the second worst because Uncle Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's the best song on the first side, which is interesting. It's a Beautiful Day to me is stunning. It's a country rock ballad, not so far removed from Poco's picking up the pieces during the chorus. It's a great song, I think. I do like this song. Um, for me, I enjoy it. And then when, you know, there's that tempo change where the chorus comes in and it's faster, it's a little jarring for me. I guess mm. I wanted that whole chill feel all throughout. So I like the, the switching gears on this one. Sorry, Angie. <laughs> no, no, that's <laughs> No, this is what we do best. Contention is the, you know, this is where things really take off. I think Eleuthera is a classic and I think it's what he does best. So it's chiming acoustic and that breathy voice. Eleuthera is the best track so far, I think. Just dripping with beauty, plus the bonus of Mike Brown on piano. Yeah, I agree. I gave this one a four. Uh, again, it's that chill vibe. I, I want to go to his little island. <laughs> you know, it just sounds so nice. This is the version of Grand Pianist that's a miss for me. It's got the Liberace vibe to it. Mainly, I'm going to blame Mike Brown because he's on piano. I usually like the stripped down versions of songs, but for some reason... I this one to me feels underproduced or under something. It, it needed more to it. I, I do prefer the montage version, surprisingly. Yeah. The only pothole in this record to me is the grand pianist and Uncle Charlie back to back. To me, that stops the album a little bit in its tracks or at least slows it down. Uncle Charlie, it's deep fried truck stop boogie about reefer. <laughs> uh, in the little feet mold and i guess he was still interested in trying all these different things but this is not a good look on him i think that country-ish rock kind of feel it i don't know it doesn't work for me either i mean it is it's a fun song about weed but it's got a funky little drum break that i kind of like for me it's not the worst song on the album no, there. i give it a thumbs up i'm just not wild about it yeah, yeah, I, I gave it a, a three. Sharon, you hate this song. To me, this is one of those druggy songs, and it's one that's upbeat. <laughs> then we're at the end of the side, and we've got a really, really interesting song to parse. Oh, I've got to try slash zip zap medley. So first, I want to start the, the discussion by asking Sharon, was Bert a junkie by this point? Because he sure is singing about it, and it's incredibly vulnerable with all his pores wide open, and it's an incredible piece of work. There is not a lot of material at this point that talks about about heroin. So next to Cold Turkey, it's the only other song I can think of that's unusually honest about the topic during that time. Absolutely. He, while he's singing about his, his life. Was he a doctor or was he a junkie at this point? You'll take this as a yes. The uh, art director for this album, and I love the art direction of this album, <laughs> Frankie Andalino, did a book called Frank and Charlie or Frankie and Charlie. And um, it, it's a memoir. And he does have a little section in the book about Bert. You know, he didn't realize that Bert was and so when he came when he met him in his apartment to um follow up on this concept of bert going to the refrigerator and just interacting with bert and Artie both he came to that conclusion so that's how i definitively knew through reading it in frankie andalino's book so i guess the short answer is yes i would like to just quote the lyrics uh, in case you thought that maybe he wasn't 
quite as direct as I was alluding to. Oh, Lord, I don't know why I can't be happy just by living, destroying all the things God's given to me, a junkie. It's hard to get by, but oh, I try, but still I can't decide. But if I'm alive, believe me, I've tried. But it tore me alive inside. My heart had no life. And I really hate to stop because I'm so high. But man, I've got to try. Oh, I've got to try. I mean, that's the, the desperation. Yeah, absolutely. And the I mean, honesty. 1970, he's got another 20 years of his life to have to endure this. I mean, it's it's a prison. Off and on, yeah, definitely. Yeah, this song to me, I I almost can't even listen to it anymore because it's so gut wrenchingly yeah sad. Because he really is just admitting that he's a junkie and it's taking everything away from him. It's the you know like the the vocal itself isn't great, but it's because there's so much pain behind it. And yep, I, I think that's why. Oh, because God. I agree, but I I think he was trying to reach for a place of honesty in the vocal that was yeah. not about hitting notes. Right. It, that's exactly it. It was more about the feeling and uh, it it's just so sad and unfortunate. You know, so blatantly honest and he puts the words together and he grabs your gut and your heart and and that's what art is, you know? Exactly, exactly. And speaking of art, Fart Argonkel was involved in the creation of the next track. It was great at Woodstock, but frankly, I think to kick off the second side w with what feels here, honestly, to be kind of a superfluous cover, I like it. I'm just, he's still writing so well that I, I, I don't want to hear a cover at this point. So in The Pied Piper of Woodstock, which is uh, Artie Kornfeld's memoir, he recalls that Paul Simon later said that Burt's rendition of America on record that Art had produced was better than Simon and Garfunkel's. And also, Artie said, I've been told that this performance was the only standing ovation at Woodstock. Uh, as Kornfeld also noted, Summer turned this into a joke and would say, yeah, I got the standing ovation on their way to the bathrooms. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've heard that quote before too. I think I read it. I do love him doing the song, but this album version it, it just lacks the excitement of the Woodstock version because right. you, you know it was so about finding America and you feel like all these uh, hippies gathered to Woodstock and they found their America. So it made sense at Woodstock, but I agree it doesn't belong on this album. I want to hear his writing it's like when you're because you're in theater you know when you discover something in rehearsal and you're like whoa that was amazing what just happened and then in the performance you try to recreate it and it's about as wooden as you can get yeah that's a good way to describe it that's exactly what it is it just doesn't have that punch that it had at woodstock yeah well just like with smile yeah same thing it's interesting that both sides start off with the same kind of issue maybe already pushed for this because maybe he wanted to do arrangements on it his way i don't know well look it's not a failure it's just he didn't recreate the vibe he recreated the song so mama if you're able more truck stop honky tonk fucking around <laughs> yep <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I actually wrote on this one worst song on the album for me. It's not a good vocal. And I just I don't care for that. Whatever you just called it, honky tonk trucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not my favorite Burt feeling on a song for sure. I, I will say that the rest of the record is fantastic. From here to the close is great. It starts with friends and we're back in his safe hurdy gurdy zone. Oh, I love this song, yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's a, a gorgeous ballad. You can do no wrong with this kind of style with Bert. I love the song. I love the sentiment in it. Your friends will always be there when the well runs dry. I think it's beautiful lyrics. I agree. This is one of my favorites. The next song, On the Other Side, another rollicking rock and roll song, Basic Nuts and Bolts, but it kicks just fine. It's I don't think it's quite as good as the other ones because the ad libs toward the end feel like a put on. The only uncomfortable fit moment on the entire record for me. And it's the final weak moment on the LP. But overall, a good song. I agree with you on that. The lyrics just jumped out at me. Who was who was to blame as I slipped down the drain? I was lost as the whole crowd looked on. I mean, I just zeroed in on that as being this is a, a cry for help or this is 
you know, the self-awareness. We got two more tracks left on the record here in the timeless life. Uh, the thing that really hit me on this uh, was the terrific pedal steel, really lively Gordon Lightfoot type moves on this, which is a sweet spot for me. I love this song. It didn't grab me the way, say, Friends did or something, but I do like it. It's not grabbing me, but I don't hate it. <laughs> Karen, you too? Who are you going to side with here? Uh, you know, it's not one of my favorites, but, you know, I'm fine with like it. I'm all, um, alone. I'm all alone over here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I think we're all going to agree on the on the album closer. We're all playing in the same band is an excellent single that only very mysteriously hit number 48. But to me, it's almost as great a song about the Woodstock Festival as Joni Mitchell's song. I agree. I think this is a fantastic song. I don't know. I've heard that it was he wrote it at Woodstock. Sharon, do you know, is that true? Yeah, I heard that and I thought, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, well, I I shouldn't say it like that because Artie said it, and uh, and I thought, oh, he's exaggerating maybe. But then when I did more research, I learned how quickly Bert could turn a song around and how prolific he was. That I totally believe he wrote this at Woodstock, just like Artie said when he wanted Artie to feel better because he had taken some bad LSD or something. I mean, I don't know the particulars, but I totally believe that Bert could go off and in 10 minutes come back with this song. I just do. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Based on research and based on how I know his music now better than I did when I first started out. In terms of why it wasn't a bigger hit, it came out in 1970, and I think already the decade had soured, and uh, the whole perky, I think the Woodstock thing was kind of over already you know you think so because i know the movie came out in, in 1970. no i'm talking about the feeling the vibe of, of right. music uh it got dark in the, in the early 70s you know music the glam rock thing was coming on nixon it was just the optimism was kind of over and um i don't know I think you had the jackson five you had the carpenters if anything, not to be contrarian, but the darkness that you're speaking of, when I think of that, I think of Sly and the Family Stone, stuff that was coming around the bend, but wasn't quite there in 70. It was kind of in between those two zones. But mm -hmm. I, was, I wasn't I was alive then, so it's all conjecture. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I know there were boppy, upbeat songs, but to me, it, it kind of makes sense that this didn't make it into the downward curve of the, the new decade. You know, it has that post mid 60s optimism, you know, late 60s, like that was over, you know, it kind of was over. The flowers were wilting, you know, the flowers I, in your hair. I get what you're saying, because I feel like, again, I wasn't alive in that time either, but I I feel like that whole hippie vibe kind of started to sour at Altamont, which was December 69, I believe. Yeah. Right. I think right after Woodstock, it all kind of yeah. started to sour and the song right. came after, you know, all of that. This came out in 70. So it was kind of running on the fumes of the peace and love era. It seems like there's more of a push to set Bird up as a James Taylor-esque dude with some muscularity underpinning him. More in tune with a singer-songwriter meets denim-clad session guys in a wood-paneled studio. And in my mind, there's wall-sized windows overlooking the water and dishes of cocaine all over the place, one in every room. This is, to me, a step down from the debut. Just a little too much muscle for me. Too much grit and sweat, dirt under their nails. I don't prefer my Burt served up that way, but there's a hearty helping of solid material here for sure. And I'm going to give it four and a quarter stars. Yeah, I would give this one actually a, about a four. It's got some really nice moments on it. There's a couple missteps in my opinion and, you know, some painful things to listen to. So, but I would give it a four. Don't worry, Sharon. I'm not going to peer pressure you. I know how painful that can be. I only have it in album form. So, you know, when I... You know, when I play it, I enjoy it. And I, I always forget what songs are on what album. So I am the worst with that. <laughs> well, you're on the wrong show then. <laughs> I told you that from the get-go. 1971, another self-titled Burt Summer. No, We're no longer inside Burt Summer. Now we're just 
Bird Summer. And this is on Buddha Records. So we kick off with Stick Together, which is another winning Woodstock style anthem. It seems he's like he's looking for a lane in which to stick and stay. It's a great song, but we're veering toward the middle of the road now with the Kumbaya opener formula. I would agree with you on this one. I, I do. I like the lyrics, the sentiment and everything. I'm, it's not my favorite, though. And to start the album with this is a little bit, eh, I don't know. <laughs> Just kind of meh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I. but the thing is, I, I really do love it. I just feel like, okay, he's trying to like have a formula now. This entire album is a little bit, it sounds more polished. Inside, it, it sounds a little bit sloppy at times, but this one to me sounds more polished. That's Which a good, be thing good and bad. Exactly. Sometimes it's a good thing, sometimes not. Sharon, you like the opener on this one? I don't play this one a lot. I only have it, like I said, on the CD. So, I mean, when I'm in the car, yeah, hey, yeah sure, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> love is winning is next and i love those stuttering drum rolls that brighten up the tune i think it's one of the best on the record so sweet and with just the right amount of melancholy that courses through it this could have been a smash hit in my opinion i completely agree with you i put a big heart next to this one i love the harmony throughout yes i love those drums and it's just so positive it's about love love is winning how could you not love that yeah. this is one of my favorites also i have a big Kind of, I, I highlight the ones that I love, and this is one that yeah, me too. There. I highlight the ones that I like, and then I highlight and italicize the ones that I love. <laughs> she knows me better, you know, grandiose Levon era Elton John Paul Buckmaster moves, you know, with those crazy string charts. Oddly, in parts, this sounds like Don't Go Breaking My Heart that's slowed down to a crawl. Admittedly, Bert pulls it off, but I, although he's trying on a peer's clothes after having snuck in his wardrobe, it's a good song, but a slight step down from the previous two. Then there's a totally superfluous cover of The Rascals' People Gotta Be Free from his buds back in Long Island. You know, there's some really strange uh, cover choices on here. And honestly, the first time I listened to this, I didn't even realize it was The Rascals, too. I get that he's, you know, they're friends of his, he's paying tribute, but, you know, just like uh, the problem I had with America. This is a strong songwriter and I want his songs on the records. Agreed. Yep. I Wondered Where You'd Be is a classic from his 60s days that easily could have been on Road to Travel and actually existed back then and he played it at Woodstock to boot. Given that high standard of quality, it's amazing to me that it took Bert this long to find a home for it on a record. Well, we are so far on the same page on this album. I, I Again, I put a big heart next to this one. Yeah, he did do this one at Woodstock and this should have been on Road to Travel and Instead of simple man <laughs> yes but yes it's I, amazing that it totally would have fit on that record yeah it would have been a better choice but i i absolutely love this song and i actually like the arrangement on, on the, the studio recording i think the guitars sound nice on it i do love the woodstock version with the organ i i just love I replaced yeah. Oregon. If only it was on that first record, honestly. Yeah. Okay, so next up is a co write with Mike Brown again, Magic Elixir, which is a decent key change, crazy, frantic pop firecracker, but not as throat grabbing as the slower material on the record. I don't love it. In fact, I, I honestly don't have much to say about it because I don't listen to that one that often. I kind of skip over it. <laughs> yeah, that's a like not love for me. The people will come together. Another like not love. It's a pretty little rise and fall togetherness ballad that yearns for peace to bring us all together. And it's a bit of a yawn to me. But maybe I'm just being an anti anti war crank when the people all come together, say there's going to be peace forever. That's what we're working with. Sorry, I can't hang. The message is too facile for me. It is, to be fair, a pretty enough song, though. Just dodge the lyrics and you'll be fine. I haven't really heard Bert be political or anything until this song, I guess. It was from an Italian uh, film documentary crew was there or something filming uh, a be-in or, or an anti-war gathering at the park. And it was in the band shell and, uh, and they caught Bert doing it. And it was co-written by John Wilhelm, who has been very helpful to me and he um was bert's roadie and his friend he he met him right before woodstock and he was the one that got bert to woodstock 
<laughs> so they wrote this together and because I like John and I like the whole idea that, you know, Bert did get, you know, political here for a moment. <laughs> I like the song. The next one is really interesting to me because I didn't know it was a cover at first. It's a show tune of sorts, right? From South Pacific. Yes, Rogers and Hammerstein. I didn't know that. So um, when I'm first listening to it, I'm thinking, holy shit, this is like a gorgeous ballad that seems to hang in the air like smoke. It just is so super floaty, totally a great new direction he could have gone in. Yeah. Heavy strings are actually, in my opinion, a very good look on Bert. Then I learned it was a cover, and that blew me away, because this is a super good fit on the guy. I always focus on the vocals as a singer, but just a beautiful, natural vocal from him, and it's, you know, my favorite voice of his. I, I think it's beautiful. When he does a cover, usually to me, he just knocks it out of the park, and I sort of forget the original. Um, he sort of makes this his own, and I know the original very well from the from this musical uh, my mother used to play it when i was a little oh, okay. girl and it's a classic and he he totally reinvents it and it's beautiful the way he sings it it sounds like he he did write it himself you know that's the thing i didn't even think to investigate if it was a cover because it sounded like he was singing from his soul the next song couldn't be any different from that because it's truck stop, Bert. <laughs> the same old story as a skipperoo and my least favorite track on the record. I'm with you. He's starting a little bit with the affected vocal that I'm not a fan of. So me in the sunshine, that could have been a hit if marketed correctly. It's just this sprightly, optimistic, beaming little love song with a hop, skip and a jump in it that is just perfectly rendered by Bert. Back on the bag, more heroin? Is that what, is that what, uh... That's what I imagined it was about. And it's interesting because on Inside Bert Summer, when he sings, I've got to try, he's talking about himself. But in this one, it's like he's singing about his friends that are junkies. So I... This is a, a classic, I think. It's actually, it's such a good song. One of the best tracks on the record. Such sweet, melancholic changes to the melody and such warmth to the playing and production. It's sad, but I, yeah, I would agree with you there. It is, it's a pretty good one on the, the album. I noticed the same thing that Angie did. He moves it into a third person and, and not himself. And I, I wonder, you know, if there was any kind of intent behind that. Well, if the biographer is asking us, guess who's not going to have an answer for you? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the Battle of New Orleans, the closer on the record, uh, uh, it's the one that I'd be least likely to correctly guess is Bert. It's a great energetic little closer, brief and ass kicking. Not great, but solid. Kind of a strange choice for a cover, but what I like about it is it sounds like he is having fun singing it, like he just really loves the song. I'm guessing he grew up with this song like I did, and so I think he just had a particular affinity for it and wanted to cover it and did a great job. So there's not a heck of a lot of difference between what Inside Bert Summer was trying to do and what the eponymously titled one's attempting. To set Bert up as a sensitive singer-songwriter that can also kick you right in the nuts with his rocking out ways. Uh, it works. It also falls on its face a few times here and there, too. But ultimately, there are just a crap load of not just solid, but very affecting songs here that are worthy of serious examination by the soldiers of sound out there. Surprising to me how solid this material still is this far into his career. I give it four stars. Yes, I gave it the exact same thing, four stars. He is doing a really great job of showing his versatility on on both of these albums. But this one is just seems more polished. And so I'm a fan. I give it a four. I, I feel like it could have been a double album, uh, the two records. Uh, it's good that it's not, but they're so of a piece that it's yeah. hard to distinguish them. Hey, lads and ladies, Dave Gebro here. I abandoned my career and moved my family 3,000 miles to be able to focus exclusively on discography. And so if you're like me and enough is just never enough, then please visit patreon.com slash discography and become one of our Patreon soldiers of sound. Discography is an entirely listener supported show, and it's also intended to be a three times a week music deep dive experience. 
So do us both a favor and consider giving it a shot. Trust me, I'm working hard for the money, so hard for it, honey. There's the main show on Friday, a Monday wild card episode, which is either a soul bearing interview with that week's special guest or an offshoot show like Queasy Listening and Rock Cousteau. And then on Wednesdays, there's the humdinger of them all Discography's The Private Press with Paul Major. You got nothing to lose. If you don't dig it after a month, you're refunded. No questions asked. Once again, that's patreon.com slash discograffiti. Phase two. Even after getting arrested, Bert can't even get arrested. 1972 to 1990. I want to start this section off with a quote. In 1985, Bert was on public access cable, and he said in his words, in 1973 and four... And then he kind of stammers and tries hard to search and find the right words to describe being a desperate junkie. And then he continues, I was trying to get my head together and I wasn't doing a good job of it. Like I was like really weird at that point. He was arrested for breaking into a car in 1974 after sliding down into uh, what I'm led to believe is was abject junkiehood meaning he wasn't creating a lot of new stuff. It was the drugs taking over and kind of guiding his decision-making process. So that year, in 74, he was sent to an upstate New York correctional facility uh, as part of a new rehab program that was designed for the city's youthful drug offenders and the domino effect of petty crimes that ensued. Sharon, am I painting the correct picture of this? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much. Uh, it was a, a low security place. It was a, a wildlife center that had been converted into a low security rehab place. And he was there just a few months and was let out to perform in Brockport on weekends under uh, Rob Landis's care. Rob was a counselor that ran a musical therapy program in Iroquois, which is the refuge, right? Uh huh. It was music and recreational therapist. Yeah. So uh, Rob, who was an equally young young guy like Bert, was surprised to learn that this gangly, overgrown kid. A bird at this point was in his mid twenties that he could actually sing. So he immediately put the spotlight on the new star of his in-house band. Then they formed a trio in Brockport. Bird Summer, Rob Landis, and Gary Roberts, also known as Johnny Rab. They played local clubs and cafes in this college town for a couple of years, right? Right. So what happened from nineteen seventy one to seventy four? Was it was it just drugs? I mean, was there anything that he created that was anything akin to the career he'd been leading? Well, he was going out on a lot of gigs. He was still getting gigs, uh, playing at folk festivals and smaller gigs, college gigs. You know, he was still going out, sometimes with Ira at the beginning. Right after Woodstock, they did, you know, like Carnegie Hall and um, Porchester. So and he would open for like Poco. And so he was still going out getting some gigs mainly i guess through his manager and um and then they just sort of getting tough there right yeah yeah definitely you know it had to be hard going to port chester and seeing everybody from woodstock was a headliner there and bert was just an opening act we don't normally do tons of bootleg stuff but at this point there's you know, there's such, it's just breadcrumbs. So Sharon, you had actually sent me a recording of uh, his cover of Tom Waits, All 55. And frankly, I just thought it was going to be, well, I'll, I'll just listen to this so I can get a feel of what he was going for. I wasn't expecting anything of it, frankly. So it was his Brockport trio in 75, right? Summer, Landon, right. Roberts, performing at the Wine Press in Rochester, New York. And it's as good and as affecting as anything he's ever done. I give it four stars. Yeah, I'm with you on this one. I played this over and over and over. I give it five stars. Actually, I've got the recording of the whole Wine Press thing, and I, it's phenomenal. And think that was from Sharon, so thank you, Sharon. I still play hey, it. Hey, Sharon, you're withholding. I got it. <laughs> Oh, I man, think I've got though so much this bootleg. is <laughs> it was on Paris's radio show. Yes, this there was a link where you could listen to it online. I, I got to hear that. Is it all as good as this? Because this is solid. Is it all covers and originals? Is it a combo? Yeah, What's it's it's a little bit of both. And it, the only problem with it is there's a <laughs> Sharon knows there's a lot of tuning 
retuning in between each song. So if you can get past that, you know, but you get to hear Bert talking and joking about the retuning. Yeah, I mean, which is kind of funny too. It's funny. I'd love there's, to hear this. If there's you- so little of his banter available anywhere that you know, I, it's it's brilliant just for that. You know, just yeah. for archival people that oh my gosh, here's Bert talking and joking, and then he gets serious about it. You know, he says, well, you know, other people open tune, and he's mentioning Joni Mitchell and Richie Haven. So he's kidding around, but then he immediately gets very serious about things, you know, which I find interesting. I, I need to hear this whole thing. So uh, please- I'll send you the link. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's so good, David. Yes, please listen to it. And, uh, you know, the covers he does are are amazing. Like he does If I Were a Carpenter. The last song on there, Best of My Love, is so gorgeous, the Eagles tune. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he starts by kind of just doing covers with the post-rehab bandmates, but then starts writing some songs that will end up that'll wind up ending up on the 1977 album and the Homegrown website. There's cassette tapes of this era that surface from time to time. Nothing really even up to bootleg, just private collections. Is that right? I think so, yeah. To, so far, to my knowledge. So he's putting new material together. The trio finagle a summer slot at the hugely popular Schaefer Music Festival in Central Park in July 75. Then Burke gets antsy. He boards a Manhattan-bound bus 10 months later in May 1976, vowing more to himself than his bandmates, I'm not coming back until I get a record deal. So he hit the trifecta. Not only did he sign up with a major label, again, Capital, just like in 1968 for The Road to Travel, but he also got a lead part in a Saturday morning TV show. The brass ring was again within reach. Bird could almost touch it. And it was the last time that he'd ever be in that position. So he winds up on Captain Cool and the Kongs on the Croft Super Show in 1976, appearing as Flatbush only during season one. Is that right, Sharon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then during the year he was on TV, he continued writing and recording demos, stockpiling material for another record. And boom, around early 1977, he got an offer. And this turned out to be his last shot for 10 years. And that's all he was allowed. Before we start talking about 1977's self-titled Burt Summer, I want to thank Sharon for helping to clarify this section because without her, it would have been filled with inaccuracies and probably just conjecture. Dave, I'm still untangling some of these. (laughs) I know, I know. In details, because I'm working on this part right now, um, the L.A. part in the book, and... uh, The timeline is just confounding, but it's always been confounding because his life is like Philo Doe trying to separate these layers. I think the Capitol Record deal came after the TV show, but the the linchpin to all this happening was running into Artie Rip in New York City, who put him in touch with um, the Crofts and then come to L.A. and you can work on your stuff out here. And that and then the record deal followed soon after. So the thing to know about Bird Summer's second eponymously titled record from 77 is that it is definitely, unquestionably, it's his worst album. If you think it's his best album, I never want to talk to you. <laughs> um, that being said, I really thought looking at that picture, uh, the front cover, which I hate, I really hate that picture of Bert. It doesn't look like Bert. It looks like a weird nightmare version of Bert or something. It's a little creepy there. I got to say, I agree. he looks it creepy. Doesn't yeah. look like the Bert that I know. <laughs> right, right. He looks like disco Bert and that's fucked up. <laughs> So these songs were written as early as 1974 and through the next two Brockport years, 75, early 76, the promise of a record contract via Artie Rip, who he had known since 1968 through Hair, and Ron Dante was to produce. He was involved with Barry Manilow. Yeah, big time. And this, is, <laughs> this was at Bert's request. He wanted the Barry Manilow guy. Bert new Ron and uh, they went back to the hair years and he wanted he wanted a cheese shower to rain down on him because that's if you want Barry Manilow's producer that's what you're inviting he saw something different and felt something different and yeah. he got it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the capital contract <clears throat> was to actually include a second album 
that was produced by Trevor Lawrence, which never happened. So just as an inclusion here, the overflow is what you have on the homegrown site. If you look in the show notes, there's there's kind of more of the same. It's just not as good. So the single from the LP is When You Feel It, backed with Dance the Night Away. Let's rip into this thing, which, by the way, was arranged by Paul Schaefer. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> yeah. So uh, are there are there great songs on this? I would go with there's two great songs. There are some great songs on here. For me, it's the arrangements. And again, you know, like you said, that's Paul Schaefer. It's such a change in in sound for Bert. And I don't think it, it suits him well, but I do like some of the tunes on it. I was shocked that I didn't hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I really was. I could not believe it. I mean, just even the way he's singing on it, it's like he's going for this lower tone. And I'm not sure I like it all that much. I'm a fan of the folky 60s and 70s bird. I think the single is the best song on the album. So When You Feel It is a rousing, triumphant ballad. Even the cheesy style key change works. It's just, I think, a terrific song about inspiration that's appropriately produced for the time, and it doesn't even detract from the song's quality. This should have been a hit, I think. It's a nicely written song. I believe he wrote this with Michael Lembeck, who was on Captain Cool. Well, he was Captain Cool. I do like the song. It's not my favorite one on the album. Is your favorite Never Go Back? Actually, it is. How did you know? Is I that did. your other one? That's my other one, yeah. Oh, man. I, this is the one song on this album that I did play repeatedly because I really liked it. It's, it's awesome. so catchy. It just sounds like a bunch of guys standing on the street corner singing. At the end, you get that l almost literal a bunch of birds gathered around the flaming garbage pail for a self sing along yeah. uh, with a <laughs> doo wop round. It's it's fantastic. It's uh, a, an ode to never having to return to the desperation of your roots. Yeah. Which, right. uh, it's sad when you think about what happens. The other songs that I like from this record are Give It To Me, which uh, is top shelf disco era, coke enhanced pre new wave rock, sporting seriously intricate Beach Boys inspired harmony work. Also, Someone Like Me, Destiny, and We Sail Tonight. And you didn't mention She's a Woman. I like that one. This is, to me, as generic as it gets here. I don't think it's awful, but it's not going on the playlist. I like the choruses. The verses get a little mellow, but you know, it starts off with that chorus. I like it. Sharon, what are your feelings toward this record? Oh, I, they're just churning up in me. I'm trying to figure out what to say. <laughs> they're conflicting, right? I mean, I've got well, all conflicting feelings. They're conflicting not only within myself, maybe not, maybe with more with you. Enough time has gone by since 1977 that I can accept this album no matter what shape or form, what decade. I've grown to love this album, but then I also got confused because some of the Overflow songs I got on a CD and I was hearing them first. And you probably, some they're on the homegrown site. Uh, some of them I like better than the ones on this album. So he chose the songs for this album. He chose the art direction for that album cover. Whatever his headspace was at that time, he wanted it. He chose it. He was in control. He felt positive about his back. You can feel that and you can see that. I think he totally felt good about his new material. It sounded very differently when he was doing it in Brockport. It's the same songs, but they all came out to California with them with their demos and it got turned around because of the direction that Bert wanted it to go in, apparently, because he was the one that called Ron Dante. And Ron wanted to rock out. He said he had never worked with guitars with Barry Manilow. And he looked at this as, you know, an opportunity to spread his wings a little bit away from Manilow. Yeah. Now, that might be hard for some people to see, but I've grown to like all of his music because I hear the stories behind them. You know, if you invest in an artist and by the way i'm pretty sure that everyone listening to this podcast right now will be on board with this aspect if you like the artist you take everything they do and all of it is on an equally flatline democratized level <laughs> so really, like, well look at bowie <laughs> No, yeah, well, no, look at Dylan, because Dil well, Bob Dylan would make albums that intentionally alienated audiences. Those are just as crucial as Blonde on Blonde and Highway 61. And here's an interesting point that you bring that up. Intentionally alienate. Bert, his entire life, all he wanted was love. All he wanted was to be appreciated and validated 
So he was not out to be controversial. The bottom line was he wanted acceptance and love, and every single thing he put out here reflects that in some way, yes. shape, or form. Agreed, agreed. The one song that neither one of you mentioned here, I'm Alone, is possibly that. one of his most autobiographical songs, according to Johnny Rabb and the guys that knew him. They they know where this song came from and what the circumstances were. I mean, they literally came within the walls of Rikers Island is when he wrote this song. That's so sad to me because it's the most disco adjacent song on the record and a total skip for me. I'm going to mm -hmm. go back with that in mind, though. The version that he did in a room in Brockport with just an acoustic guitar, you, you felt it. You felt everything he intended. Here's my notes on this. So first of all, the cover me out so badly i hate looking at it but yet i can't stop looking at it that's the first thing and also even though the scene in boogie nights where they go into the studio to record demos happens in the 1980s i think of that when i hear this record however <laughs> even with that in mind it's way better than it has any right to be oddly Burt writes really, really good generic pop rock. I thought, no way, but yeah, he really actually does. And the most touching thing about the record that works conceptually in a way that was obviously coincidental is that this is this guy's last stab, his last valiant effort that gets a major release. And you can hear the I'm going to fucking go for it desperation in his performances, even when it's just borderline generic material. But at the center of it all, typically swallowed up whole by Paul Schaefer's busily glitzy arrangements, is that guy at the center of it all singing honestly and with lyrical honesty about his life and the fears he had about the direction destiny ultimately took him. It's sad, but it's good. And you should listen to everything else first before you bother with this, or you'll be like, what the fuck is Dave talking about? I give this three stars. Wow. I Everything that you just said makes so much sense. And I completely agree. And what I wrote was, I wish that this album had been recorded in the 90s so we could have an unplugged MTV version of it. I want to hear all of this music stripped down, get Paul Schaefer the hell out of there. <laughs> Yeah. and just play it from your heart so I can hear how you intended it. The stripped down versions, I mean, there are demos with this stuff on it. I would love for one day for the copyright issues, whatever stands in the way, and I know nothing about the music business, I would love for stuff to surface or get cleaned up or something where we could hear it because a lot of these songs were done just with, you know, guitars and bass in Brockport. To me... In a weird way, the drama of the record is the dichotomy and, you know, the, the, the honesty versus the dishonesty of the, of the musical approach. And there's a lot of drama inherent in that. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and I also see just the total trust and goodwill that Bert would always put into whoever was handling him you know it would always be like here i am here's my stuff and then he would just trust his managers or his producers to, to do right by him bert had a lot of brill building kind of stuff in him already he was really more that than he was bethel wood he's a song and dance man but he's also got the singer songwriter tools wait did we get a uh, rating from angie i don't think i got there yet i give it a three and a half okay um, so we're on the same page most of those stars go towards someone like me and never go back those two are mm -hmm. just it for me on this album so again this album was unsuccessful he was dropped by capital as bert himself would say I was involved in the two most famous countercultural events of the 60s, Hare and Woodstock. That and a token will get you on the New York subway. In 1977, a second unreleased Capital LP does not come out. It exists online. You'll find a link to it in the show notes. What is the story here, Sharon? The songs are all written approximately in the same time period, and there were a lot of them. Bert chose the ones that he wanted to put on the first album and the overflow were going to go on his contracted second album with Capitol. Ron Dante was not going to produce that. Trevor Lawrence was, but the, the plug was pulled. And um, so a single was produced, very Barry Manilow-esque. Um, oh, the, the songs in me, right? Songs in me, kind of like I write the songs and now the songs yeah, yeah. in me. That actually exists as like a promo single or something. There's a lot of songs in this collection. 
I think there's 27 tracks. I think there's two songs that are great. Get On With The Show and Syncopated Symphony. Oh man, I love Syncopated Symphony. There's a couple other songs that I think are good. All My Life too, Captain Cool, that one's solid. Top of the Pile is solid, but honestly, these are clearly not finished for the most part. But if you're a bird obsessive, there's not much to go on. So it's you got to listen to it. I think it's amazing how many unreleased tunes he had. I have so many that I love. And, you know, I'm like, well, what about, you know, Breakaway? And <laughs> what about Ordinary Storyline? <laughs> I mean, I love those two. I don't know. The fact that he's still writing, you know, that's what it's about. You just keep doing it for yourself, you know, and then weird ones, you know, Westport Sanitarium. The song You, which I don't know if you know Jack Sherman, who was one of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He he was just a kid, and he was doing the demos with Bert out here because his sister was in the band in Brockport, Gail Sherman Johnson. You know, really great electric guitar work. That's Jack Sherman usually, and um, I find a lot more here that you know I'm you know not as maybe as harsh <laughs> as discerning a critic. But uh, yeah, no, this is know. the first thing I heard by him where I was like, ooh, yeah, no, nah. but it it didn't come out, so to me it doesn't count. So. You know, as far as rating, I, mean, I wouldn't rate. Yeah, that. yeah. To me, if, if you're a creative and you're still churning out something, you know, I'm rooting for you. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly, especially in the bind he was in at the time. So from 1980 to 82, he describes on that public access show that we're going to talk about very soon, uh, he describes this period as, quote, getting in trouble, doing what I do best. Let's leave it there. Summer returned to Albany in August 1983 and almost immediately began to perform in local venues with Johnny Rabb and Carla and Kevin McCrell in the fabulous Newports. He also teamed up with Eddie Angel and Johnny Rabb in The Poor Boys. So in 1985, a couple songs I want to talk about here. In the Heat of the Night and Don't Take Candy from Strangers. I, however, do not want to talk very long about it because these are an ouch for me. This has absolutely nothing to do with what makes Bert a special artist. It was apparently just a project, something to do, total 80s. Rating N.A., but one and seven-eighths stars at pressed. Whoa, huh? harsh. <laughs> but it's not a release. The other yeah. song uh, during this time that he wrote was The Pure Clean Truth, and the version that I know of that exists is on the Sarge Blotto public access show, right? It's kind of a, just a generic blues, again, you know, of the same quality standard. Yeah, I agree. I was just re-listening to the Sergeant Blotto interview this morning. And uh, yeah, I forgot that he played that on there. But yeah, it's just a blues tune. I, I'm not a fan of the 80s sound on Burt. I mean, in the heat of the night, I'm not really a fan of. Don't Take Candy from Strangers is okay. So near the end, Burt, from what I know, sat in a little diner in, in his hometown, um, Albany, playing his Casio keyboard at the counter while singing his heart out for anyone privileged to be within earshot. The image that I have of this, is this uh, an accurate image, Sharon? I think so, yeah. So uh, then let's talk about this public access show because it came at the end of my research. It was truly, I mean, like truly heartbreaking to watch. And I mean, agonizing in a, you know, I dare you to keep watching kind of way, but seemingly crucial to me to understanding Bert. The show is called Sarge Blotto's Hot Seat, and it looked like some shithole show, you know, produced in someone's closet from May 1985. Bert is practically lunging at the camera for attention, and he's obsessively nursing a beer, desperately holding out the program to hair, and imitating Marlon Brando, I could have been someone, I could have been a contender. To, to describe it as sad is the understatement of the century. Sharon wrote a very beautiful, very emotionally insightful article for Shindig uh, in, back in 2019. And if you'll allow me to very awkwardly quote a guest on the show as she sits there and blushes... <laughs> A 1985 Albany cable TV interview on Sarge Blotto's Hot Seat begins by inadvertently chopping off Bert's latest song, Don't Take Candy from Strangers. Then the intro, riffing off of both Woodstock and Saturday Night Live comedian Billy Crystal, my inimitable and always marvelous guest, Bert, uh, Bert Summer. So the two of you have seen this. I'm sure you've parsed it in the same way that I have. 
sort of looking for clues or hints or right oh yeah i've watched this repeatedly actually and yeah you know actually what struck me this morning while i was watching it i I don't really, Sharon, maybe you can shed light on who exactly Sergeant or Sarge Blotto is. And I couldn't tell if he was really a fan of Bird or if he was kind of jokingly making fun of him or something. It just well, bothered me the tone that he had a little well, bit. Well, yeah, but Sharon told me that the two of them were actually friends and it was history. Okay. I wasn't sure either. It seemed like Bert, he always would just hog, you know, the, the spotlight, you know, without even trying, although he <laughs> evidently was trying here, but it just came naturally. But then I found out later that Sarge was playing along with it, I think. And, and he was a very well-respected musician and arts artist and, and, you know, like a big deal in the Albany music scene when Bert moved there and and he knew who Bert was and of course Bert was like wow you know instant friends because Bert didn't like to talk about his past but if you knew who he was you know then you were cool and and they were friends and Sarge by all accounts was a great guy you know and so he has this TV show he's very big in, in the Albany art scene so I mean that's where Bert was so he's he was I think the first guest on the show the thing I want to quote from your article that I haven't said yet that really nails it is not until he picks up a guitar and breaks into his closest to being a hit we're all playing in the same band is he his true as self though he's so uncomfortable in his skin the second he breaks into the song you could feel it all go away and he's in a different place entirely that's absolutely true yeah bert's last documented performance was again with johnny rabb at an outdoor concert in troy new york on june 11th 1990 and his final gig was at billy's pub in troy Bert died in Troy on July 23rd, 1990, after a long battle with a respiratory illness. It's just a sad story. He left so much great work behind. But as far as uh, the overview and shape of his arc, uh, you know, usually I come up my, with my own thing. But I, for this one, I'd like to quote Jesse, uh, his son, from a January 8th, 2020 interview. To be on top for a moment and have such possibility before you and then have it ripped away could leave someone lost, unfulfilled and frustrated. It would only feed bad habits, depression and future choices. Woodstock was the beginning of a legacy that was never fulfilled. He has a lot of fans and supporters that are on his side who want to see the music out there and be heard. There are musicians all around the world that have experienced the hills and valleys, high notes and pitfalls of the music industry, delivered with brute force and no mercy. These people do not just understand and can relate, but would love to see one of their own finally get their day. Everyone loves the comeback kid and root for the underdog. It's in our nature. What's happening now with his music is a great start, but we have a long way to go. My top three records, number three, Inside Burt Summer, number two, The Road to Travel, number one, his set at Woodstock, even if you can count that as a record, but because of the Andy Zacks re-release of the entirety of Woodstock, it counts. His worst album, 1977's Burt Summer. If there's anyone out there who disagrees with that assessment, just of his worst album, please unsubscribe. Uh, by the way, Peter Gabriel is the only man who is shittier than Bert at naming his records. <laughs> yeah, the fact that there was uh, two albums named Bert Summer was a little bit confusing to me at first. <laughs> like, yeah. think of something else. <laughs> Angie, you're killing me. I can't wait to hear your list. Similar to yours, but I went back and forth with number three. But I've got to give it to Bert Summer 1971. I'm putting that one ahead. Uh, number two, Road to Travel. And number one, Woodstock set. Road to Travel is a very, very close second, though. I definitely agree with that. If it wasn't for those two songs, it might top the Woodstock set for me. And I, I think I told you the first time we spoke, definitely the 77 Burt Summer album is is the worst one, but it's got some redeeming qualities to it for sure. He has, he has no bad released music. Right. So if you're going to check out Burt Summer, I would check out A Road to Travel first and the 77 album last. <laughs> Agreed. Just go in order. That's the best way to do it. Don't worry, Sharon, we're not going to pressure you, but I know you know <laughs> how you feel. So you're depriving us of your innards. And for that, I'll never resent you. <laughs> 
Wow, this is incredible. Um, thank you for even wanting to do this. I mean, this is... Are you kidding? This has been incredible. It's been epic. His career, which I thought was going to be a quickie, turned out to be something you, you, you really can't rush. I can't thank the two of you enough. Seriously, this has been a long time coming. And, we, you know, I was so excited about it. I actually wanted to record it during my cross-country trek. Hey, you said that, and I'm like, oh, my God. I know. I was like, you're crazy. I, I was honestly gunning for it. My wife was okay with it. You know, that was the extent of my love for this project. I can't thank the two of you enough. You want to take the floor and plug anything that either that the two of you are doing? Well, the first thing I want to say is thank you, David, for having me. I mean, just from a, a little hashtag, I found you and <laughs> here I am on your podcast now. But I just thought it was so important to get Bert's name and music out there. So um, thank you for that. And I don't really have anything to plug other than, you know, check out my smile video on YouTube. You know what? I'm going to put it in the show notes. Oh, thank you. And if you're in the uh, Chicago area, look up Miss Angie's music if you got little ones and uh, take a music class. You might hear a Burt Summer song. I would hope at this from this point forward, it would be chock full of Burt. <laughs> I tried. I, I did. We're, we're all playing in the same band a couple of times, too. Nice. Now, how about you, Sharon? Do you want to you want to plug stuff? Well, I'm working on this book, and I have to say up front that I have not pitched it anywhere. I have not received any advance from anybody. <laughs> I, it's almost like I kept working on it to see if I was serious about it or if it was going to implode on me. And now I'm at the point where I can safely say I'm pretty sure I'm going to be done with draft one by Bert's birthday, which is February 7th. Wow. Coming up soon. Coming up soon. That's uh, so exciting. Yeah. That's yeah. nuts. I, mean, I didn't realize you were so close. Well, no, I'm probably not, but I'm saying it. <laughs> That's awesome. Because I think people find Bert. He's there. If he gets on your radar, you know, you're a good one, but he needs to be out there on a larger radar screen. You know, today I was just. I was just going through some, I got a lot of my leads from YouTube comments and I hadn't looked at any in a while. And I looked up the road to travel and this one guy just recently wrote, I wish he was recognized more as a musician and a human being. And then somebody responded, people die twice, first their body and the second time when no one remembers them. It's in our hands to keep them alive. And I thought, wow, that was just what I needed to read today because that's exactly what I feel like I'm doing or trying to do. So beautiful. And mm -hmm. it's, it is a perfect dovetailing. And how do we top that? We got to end there. <laughs> All right, that about does it. As an aside, Sharon stuck to her word, and the first draft of her Burt book is finished. We'll keep you updated as it careens toward an inevitable publication. A heartfelt discography thanks goes out to our graphic designer, Todd Zimmer, my beautiful wife and son, Jen and Mason, Angie Pope, Sharon Watts, and Ira Stone, my incredibly loyal fans, and especially the entire Patreon community, the Soldiers of Sound. I love every last one of you, and this show would not exist without you. But wait, just a minute. This is just the entrance to the rabbit hole. No need to stop now, because we're on a roll. Join us as we descend down, down, down on this deep dive. Get thee directly to either Ira Stone, episode 81, or Burt Summer, part 1, episode 83, or to segue into different Woodstock territory, be sure not to miss our Sweetwater special, episode 79. Subscribe to our Patreon and keep your eyes peeled throughout the week, because this Monday continues our deep dive with our Patreon-only wildcard episode all about the gigantic 38-CD Woodstock box set, Back to the Garden, that collects the whole enchilada, every moment of which I've heard, of course, not to mention Wednesday's incredible Patreon-only episode of Discographies The Private Press with Paul Major, wherein we'll be covering Michelangelo's magnificent late 70s nod to the Aquarian Age, which injected a badly needed dose of psych into the disco-ridden proceedings. That's patreon.com slash This is an entirely listener-supported show, and I offer a full, no-questions-asked, money-back guarantee. So if you dug the episode, 
You don't have an excuse. Check it out right this second. Thank you so much in advance. And be sure to mark your calendars, because next Friday, March 24th, we're coming at you with the John Landis Tapes, Volume 1, which kicks off a six-volume, once-a-month, long-form interview series with the legendary director of classics like Animal House, Blues Brothers, Michael Jackson's Thriller Video, Trading Places, and Coming to America. And so, from now till then, don't let our youth go to waste, lads and ladies. It's Discography. Discography.